Well, good morning, folks. It's Lee Farnell here from Everyday Empowerment Institute. And today with me is Paul Maggiatis from East West Enterprises. And we're going to talk a lot about scaling your business, freeing up your time so that you can actually leverage and get more done and make more money. Paul, thank you so much for agreeing to be on this Everyday Empowerment Institute podcast. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for having me, mate. Pleasure, pleasure. I love your background there as well. Paul is involved in so many different businesses. But Paul, before we get started, what I'm going to do is just give you some background on Everyday Empowerment Institute to to set the scene, because I can see with all those logos behind you, we are in the business of literally this, empowering to unleash the inner entrepreneur in everyone. And you, I can see straight away, you're an entrepreneur in you've got mad. Tell me the businesses you've got behind you there. All right, so Lee, we've got we've got a um a real estate business, Coleman Magiatis. We've got a, a property investment business in SecFi that's been going for a while now. We have two mortgage businesses, two mortgage brokerages, uh, Fin Mortgages, and I think if I do this, you'll see Nash Funding Solutions, and of course there's East West Enterprises up over my shoulders. Right. So I can see you are an entrepreneur starting businesses and and making the run. So um, what you're, you're not just talking theory here. We're going to be talking about real life, you know, experience in your own your own life. So Paul, Everyday Empowerment Institute, what we want to be doing is systematically educating, empowering, helping people learn the things that they don't learn at school, don't learn at uh, primary school, secondary school, college, university, TAFE. I mean, you know, you might learn a little bit of it in a business course, but not the everyday tools that you can use to actually, you know, create financial freedom uh, and and live the life you want to live. So, Paul, mate, uh, can I get your background? You and I have known each other for a number of years now, but for the for the for the listener, what your background? Tell us a bit about the Paul Maggiata story. Oh, gee, uh, my background is is a series of accidents. Uh, my my father was on. <laughs> it is. In fact, everything you see in the background is a series of accidents. They just happened through necessity. So my dad was on the Alcamos, the haunted ship, the Alcamos off the coast of Two Rocks, um, which sunk, um, and they couldn't get it off. So they were basically stuck in Australia with with, with no money, no country, and, and uh, didn't speak a word of English. Wow. My mum was flown over by an uncle because the the village she was in, uh, the, the Germans came through. Well, they killed all the men. There were no men. There was no future. So she came over on a boat and ended up in the desert where she met my father. Wow. So I'm um, kind of the the the, uh, the result of two two immigrants from Greece, both both illiterate. Basically, mum never went to school. The Germans and the Italians never let them go to school. So mum was completely illiterate. Uh, and Dad, I think he did up to maybe grade seven before he jumped onto the merchant navy and spent his his life on on ships. So, so that's kind of my background. And I was brought up in in um, in Kalgoorlie because that's where they ended up for work, as most immigrants still do today. You come in and you do all the jobs that no one else wants to do. Wow! And you go to all the places that no one else wants to go. So I was there till I was gee, in my twenties, and we typically. Um, fish and chip shops, um, sandwich bars, taxis, all those jobs that that um, most immigrants do. And it's still happening today. There's no change. It's just the, the, the countries have changed. The jobs are still the same. So I kind of learned uh, my, my business acumen, I suppose, from those kind of very basic hands-on businesses. And I learned very quickly that um, uh, if you were just going to, work for time, you would have to work your whole life. And I used to watch these guys in Kalgoorlie at the time that were just off the mining and they were driving with Ferraris. And I thought, why is it that these guys make so much money and have such a nice life and I'm working 15 hours a day and don't seem to be getting any further? The only way I can make more money is to work harder. It took me a little while to figure it out, and, and I just I just would ask them whether I knew them well enough. And Calgary is a small enough place to sit with people and say, "Well, give me a hint. How did you get from like this this guy I knew who who um, was a real estate agent to being someone who controls most of the town, owns all the pubs, all the businesses? Uh, you know, the first guy with a mobile phone in town 
ringing New York Stock Exchange. How does that happen? And these guys are great. I mean, they're happy to share. Yeah. Uh, and sort of from there, I sort of dabbled in, in, in investing to give that a go first. And, uh, they're not 19 years old and, and tried business, very small businesses, uh, and over time just figured it out really. Uh, you know, the biggest takeaway really is, is fail fast. Give it a go. Mm. Fail fast, get it done, figure out your mistakes up front before it becomes too expensive to make them and, and go from there. If you, can, if you can just take the leap of faith, get in there, fail fast, knock out all the obstacles first, figure out what they are, you, you, you're 80% of the way there if you get all the negative stuff out of the way first. So it's, wow. That's, that's where we came from. We just came from, you know, couldn't speak English to grade three. And, and figured it out. But my maths is okay. Right? That's Good with numbers. Mm. Well, there's a whole lot of fantastic uh, information there that you've already shared in terms of work ethic, being exposed to, to small business, uh, obviously around, uh, you know, language, the difficult overcoming problems. Um, boy, oh, boy, there's, there's really a story there. Let's just go to what I want to show you here, our, our ladder of business evolution uh, model um, where, where we know, you know, whether it be your mum and dad, uh, if you're starting a business from scratch or just an idea, we say it's in non-existence. And then you go into what we call emergency and danger where it can easily fall over without enough cash flow uh, to where it's up and running in a normal operation. Um, and it's interesting you say there that, that, when you start asking people about business and money, those people who are already successful often are only too happy to help you move up that ladder. They, they, because yeah. they go, we know how hard it is, the, the gravitational forces that kind of can pull you down as well. We say there's gravitational forces there. And they say, let me show you some of those steps. Let's make those steps the small steps rather than large impossible steps to, to get up that that ladder, which of course is what we're what we're on about uh, at Everyday Empowerment Institute, is let's help people like, get with small step by step approach to go up that ladder. So straight away, you've also then talked about the importance of a mentor, learning from other people's experience yeah. rather than uh, your own experience. So just on that, one of the questions we like to ask is, what are some of the lessons or the mantras even that you remember some of those people telling you? And you've already touched on there the. The, the working for t working and selling time versus uh, investment or passive or leveraged income. What are some of the things those people might have, you you can recall between your ears that the lessons they gave you in those early days? Oh, easy and and they're very simple lessons, and we tend to forget them. The basics of all economics is to feed your family, and the basics of all economics. And uh, one of the guys I respect in, in Cal that, that taught me a lot: spend less than you earn. Mm. is actually quite clever. It's a simple thing, but spend less than you, but no one does it. Everyone gets out there and takes out more money, borrows more funds at 12, 13, 14%, whatever it takes to scale. But the cost of the scale, the cash flow hasn't caught up to it, it collapses. So <laughs> it's, 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 a simple, it's a simple statement, but also a very complex one if you, if you drill down. So spend less than you earn. And, and again, um, Fail fast. I learned that one a long time ago. Um, start making mistakes up front when it's less expensive. It's far less expensive to make those mistakes when there's three of you than when you've got an organisation that's you know, a million plus and 10 employees and then you, you find out you've got a serious hiccup in your process flow. Uh, that then costs you a lot more. So, yeah, um, fail fast. And another, 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 and I think... This comes from a book. Get which one, but failing forward. Failing's fine. You gotta just gotta mm. get more times than you lose, but you wanna be failing forward in the same direction as you plan. So if you've got a, a clear pathway where you wanna be and you, you know, something, there's an obstacle in the way, at least by trying to overcome the obstacle, if that doesn't work, you're still failing forward, right? You think, okay, well, that didn't work, but I'm still at the same point. I can go forward from here. Let's yeah. find another solution. Just keep, keep, Keep going forward. 
Keep so attitude to uh, clearly attitude to failure and 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 failing in the direction of your if your if your plan, which then comes down to making sure you've got a plan. Like where are, where where do you want to go on this ladder of business evolution? Where is your business in one, two, three, five, ten years time? Um, that's as distinct from well, I want to I'll have exact I'll be in exactly the same position. You, you certainly don't want that, do you? No, absolutely. You, yeah, you need to have a plan, and it needs to be a long plan. You can, you can break it down, as, as you know. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And I love that letter. That's magnificent. The way you presented that, that is exactly how life is. Make it achievable and people will climb up it. If, you, if those rungs are too far apart, it's too hard to do. But yeah, have a plan, work towards it. Make it a long plan, chunk it down. But you've got to have, you've got to play the long game. Your life's a marathon, right? So yeah, you've got to have that long-term view so then the first year doesn't become as daunting because you know you've got another 40 to go, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, funny you should say that. It reminds me uh, of Bill Gates saying that, you know, most people underestimate how much they can get done in 10 years, but they overestimate what they can do in one. Um, it's like, you know, as you say, have a longer-term game. And you're reminding me of when we did work with McDonald's a number of years ago, one of the one of the franchisees, uh, beside, one is a very successful business person, he literally had his life plan mapped around the wall of his study. So, so he'd had it in two years. This is where I'm going to be. In five years, this is where I'm going to be. In ten years, this is where I'm going to be. So there it was, visual. I, I mean, like a timeline on his wall. Because this guy was an achiever. In fact, the whole family were achievers. But it was, it was his plan was. And I'm just, you know, marked on his wall, which was just a, a fantastic, uh, you know, visual conscious and a subconscious reminder on a regular basis. So, Paul, today in particular, we, and we've spoken about this, you know, so often people in small business are struggling along, go, I don't have time, I'm flat out doing this, I'm flat out doing that. But in fact, often they're flat out doing the wrong things. And one of your businesses there, East West Enterprises, is all about going, stop being flat out doing the wrong things. So can you talk about um, what you guys do there and, and, and tips and recommendations for those people that go, I'm flat out, mate. It's, oh, it's crazy. So, so East West Enterprises was, again, it started out in necessity 2008 when we couldn't get staff to run our, our property investment business. We couldn't get processing staff for under $80,000 per person per year because the mining industry at the time was flat out. So we took it overseas, started an office in, in the Philippines, put staff on there. And, and created a business processing centre of our own at the time to, to staff our own businesses. So the idea is it's actually nothing to do with outsourcing, right? It's more about buying back time. So an example would be, and I'll use real estate because it's an easy one to do because most salespeople, great at selling, really bad at paperwork, but they end up doing their paperwork. So, so if a sales worth 20 grand, which is about right for an $800,000 property, right, um, that's about five hours of property in this current market. Yeah. It's a pretty good hourly rate. Mm. But then the admin for that, that would take that agent 40 to 50 hours to complete the administration on that. And it's because there's a lot more to it than people think, right? Uh, and to be compliant, it's about 40 hours. So if you can, if you can buy back those 40 hours at 18 bucks an hour, and spend four or five hundred dollars of your own of, of that twenty thousand to have someone else do those forty hours. You're still on about four grand, a little little under four grand an hour. Yeah, which so is still a very good number. Bother, why would you bother doing the admin if you're no good at it when you can proceduralize it very specifically, hand it offshore, send the O and A over or the contracts over, and then it's just a ticker box system to settlement. You've bought yourself. 40 hours back, you're still making best part of 19 odd thousand dollars and you've won back 40 hours of your life where you can go to the beach with your mates, catch a few waves, have a coffee, go make another sale. Which is, as so, you say, one, do what you do best and what you get paid most for. Uh, and as you say, uh, if you can make $4,000 an hour, why would you be spending 40 hours doing uh paperwork that you can pay someone $18 an hour for. 100%. We've actually got a client in real estate that we, we back up for. They've now got a team of five. Last count, they had a team of five. 
that well, one it saves them about half a million dollars a year in, in salary, it's straight over the bottom line, but it buys back all their time. So this yep. business has scaled like you wouldn't believe. It's just scaled phenomenally over the few years. And um, yeah, they're very happy. They, they've got all their they've got their life back, they're on a big business, and and their bottom line is a lot healthier. It just it makes sense. Yep, yep. So what do you think what do you think is the fear that stops people doing this? Oh, uh, it's interesting you say that. Um, when I walk into a a conversation about outsourcing, most people are concerned about the security of their data or can 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 it be done overseas? Is it possible? You know? Do do these people speak English? Is it, you get that quite a lot. Hmm. It's interesting. Um, so I usually start the conversation by asking them, who is currently managing and looking after your data? Oh, it's the front receptionist. What security have you got in place for that front receptionist so she doesn't download your whole database? None. What makes you think that giving it to, to me would change that? Well, nothing. Well, well, in that case, let me make a suggestion. Let's Let's first create systems and processes with you so that your data is safe from everybody and then it won't matter where you send the work because your systems will then look after that issue. Your second issue is um, your receptionist might have a cert for it in office management, but for 50% of that hourly rate, you can get someone who's a fifth-year law student doing the same work uh, and I can guarantee you they'd probably be more concerned about your data than your receptionist. Yep, yep, so, yep. So normally it's around um, language barrier, um, data security and, and qualifications is generally what they're around and we, we can take care of all those issues very quickly. The data issue is an internal issue. We don't handle the data. We dial into your system. So if your system is not set up with different levels of security, then your data is at, at risk from everybody in your office right now. First, let's fix that. Then we can offshore. Fantastic. I mean, straight away, that's a fantastic tip. As you say, people who aren't IT savvy um, are not even aware that you should have a different levels of security. So, so obviously, as the owner, you have the highest level of, or the you know the the most access. Whereas you can limit the access for the user overseas, um, and they uh, do the job without having full access or ability to download or or change the whole system. So that's a great tip in itself, Paul. And of course, for the small business, that that business at uh, let me just go back to that ladder so that we're on, on the same page there. But for that small business, I mean straight away this this slide we say. If you use the same old thinking, you're going to get the same old results. So if you want to get different results, straight away, some of the thinking you've just spoken about there of, hey, listen, if you can make $100, $200, $4,000 an hour, why would you spend 40 hours? Change your thinking to change your results, spend $18 an hour and get back out there and do the things that, A, you enjoy doing and B, you're good at. Um, and you're challenging that, that fear factor. And as we say, it, it starts to get simple. One, uh, change the security levels on your system that, for people to get access to. And two, you start to go, what, what other jobs either I, I, I don't enjoy doing that take up a ton of my time um, that I can begin to, to, to offload so that we actually do scale up. Now, from your point of view, uh, can we just define, just in, in your language, when you, when you say, say, scale up or leverage, what does that mean for you in terms of moving up that ladder of business evolution? Oh, the, the first thing every small business should do, and I learned this, I've worked with business coaches before. Uh, I didn't have the, the skill set, so I employed someone that did. So the first thing you've got to do is create an org chart. And in right. that org chart, your name might be in every single uh, position starting from, you know, it could be the CEO, and you will also be the cleaner. So you'll have all those spots. So when you've got the cleaning down pat, you should write a procedure for it. People laugh, but we actually do. You write a procedure on how you want this office clean, how often, who does it, how long it takes, who they report to. That job you don't have to do anymore because you've made enough money now to handball that job. It's got, a, it's got a process, it's got some quality control behind it. 
uh, but you're still answering the phones, right? You're answering the phones and doing the sales. So you get 10 or 15 sales and you're flat out busy. So then you write a procedure on how to answer the phone or how to respond to to um, to inquiry. Now that, that's the most important job in the whole of your office there. And um, the reason for that is everyone rings a receptionist, right? So we've written a procedure on how that phone is answered. And before you start talking, you put a smile on your face because that will then change the way you sound. So our script for answering the phone is exactly the same every single time. Then we move up. So we've given that job because we're flat out and we need a customer service operator to control the folder because at this point I'm doing all the filing, if you like. So you write a procedure for that job because you're doing that job, right? And then that customer service clerk gets that procedure with all the checklists on how to drive a file from the sales contract, for instance, to a settlement. And I use real estate because it's easy to, to actually outsource these processes. Uh, you've written that, you give that to a junior, and that only might be, you know, that might be two days a week, four hours each to start with. It'll grow into a position, but her name then goes on that org chart. And then you just keep going up the org chart until at some point you've got a sales team and you actually have moved up to the GM. Whole new different set of skills. It's all about then measuring and making sure that everything is, is, is managed and the process flow works. So that's that's how that's how I did it. I just and we did. We wrote a process for how to clean the office and when, how to drive a file. In the end, we had that many procedures. We built a database for our procedures to be housed in an index, uh, and and then from there we went to one of our businesses, went to uh, Quality Assured ISO nine double zero one at the time, uh, because we had so many processes, we could measure pretty much everything. But it took years, but we started with the bottom end of the org chart and worked our way out. Well, that's interesting you say that because essentially what you're saying, we talk about ladder of business evolution, mm -hmm. but what you're really saying there, it's the ladder of systems evolution. And whether it be the, if the first system is cleaning the office to answering the phone, but you start to go, what are the systems that we want other people doing? Because power change literally means you're in a position where the business can run beautifully without you. And that then means you've got a business that's saleable or you've got a business where you can go away for three months, six months, 12 months, and it's running and generating profits and revenue and passive income for you. So that's that becomes the vision. As Stephen Covey said, start with the end in mind. The end in mind is not just can I pay the bills this month. The end in mind is how do I have this business operating without me um, and or selling. Now, as, as a business broker will tell you, and you know this, is, is the business is far more valuable when it runs without you Versus if you have to be there all the time, then how how can a new person come in and do it? I mean, I think you've had experience with that kind of stuff in the past, haven't you, Paul? Well, look, I 100% agree with you. And, and look, it, it becomes, it's, it's a business that evolves into an organisation because you're organised by nature. And then from an organisation that goes to an investment that other people are happy to put their money into to scale it because it works without you. And that's that's kind of evolution, right? And that's, at that point, some people, their idea of success is to list on the stock exchange, and that's what they do. My idea of success is pretty simple. It's, it's as long as I can go to the beach two to three times a week with my mates, play in the gym, catch a few waves, get to work at 10, hang out with my staff, annoy them mostly because they're cleverer than I am, um, ride my bike on a weekend and make enough enough of an income to sustain that, that's, that's my thing. So I'm happy to have smaller businesses, that, that run without me rather than having the one really big one. It's just where I ended up. But, yeah, 100%, it's, 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 you can then go to that next level because you're proceduralised, you're ready to go, you can do anything from there. Proceduralised, I like it. In fact, one of, the, one of the P's that we talk about in the ladder of business evolution is besides productization of turning your processes into products is just that, as you say, proceduralise mm -hmm. the business so that um, each box on that org, org chart uh, can have someone in there following those procedures. 
That's beautiful, mate. And of course, we, we're back doing things together in your the networking business. In fact, I think we talked about we talked about it the other day. We said calling the networkers network. And in that room, there are people of all different size businesses. Some of them are you know one and two person business, and some of them are seventy and eighty uh, and hundred person businesses. Um, and so we say uh, you need a different level of thinking as you move up the ladder of business evolution and 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 probably the most dangerous thinking is where people are at the one and two person level because they go I'm doing everything and mm. what we're saying is mate uh, if you, that's you want to get your almost that's an indictment if you say you're doing everything then you're not a business person you're a prisoner of this business card that you call a business what do you say about that uh, you absolutely 100% correct um you are a prisoner to it, and really the only way to scale is to outsource, and that doesn't mean offshoring, it just means to outsource. Um, I'll give you an example. I mean, plumbers are really good at plumbing. They're really bad at, uh, at uh, admin in general. Hmm. So it's the, the most outsourced task currently, 40% of businesses outsource bookkeeping. Yes. It's outsourced to everywhere, not just overseas. But if you're a small business and really – can't afford to outsource it onshore, you can send it offshore and get the same result for 50 to 75% less. Then it makes it workable for you. Then you can scale. So, but 60% of small businesses still do their own books. It takes them yeah, every night. They're basically wasting every evening not seeing their kids, hanging out with their wife, you know, doing flashcards with their kids that are doing their T. So there used to be TA. I don't know what it is now. Hmm. Is it a now, Lee? What? Yeah, one of those. I, I don't know. My kids, are, my kids are twenty-seven and thirty-two. So and thirty. So it's a while ago. But as, whether it be two year, uh, that final year. But I mean, or or if you've got young kids or grandkids, being able to be there at night to, to bath them and read a book to them, as distinct from sorry, Grandpa can't read the book because he's doing his books. You don't get that time back again, do you? So I was just saying, you know, uh, whether whether you're a parent wanting to help your kid with that final year of high school or whether you're a grandparent uh, wanting to read, you know, like in my case, Bath Noah and uh, read a book to him and put him to, put him to sleep, uh, that would be terrible to be uh, upstairs doing the books. Now, again, I, I've outsourced my bookkeeping and bass and everything for years, but but there's a whole range of other things that can be outsourced as well, Paul, aren't there? Um, can you run through some of the other things that, that you you guys do for people in terms of outsourcing that that take, uh, well, that help people scale and grow their business? Sure. Um, small uh, micro businesses that we're dealing with, because they're easy to explain the process. So a plumber, we've got a plumber, and an electrician on the books. The electrician uh, ended up getting really busy in this environment and he was struggling to schedule all his other uh, plumbers and sparkies to go out to the jobs. Mm -hmm. So then when I met with him, we, we, we had a look at the process they were using. They were using a process called GeoOps, which is a scheduling software. So really it wasn't a scheduling problem, it was a time problem and money problem. So we organised him with, with a, an offshore VA at... 70% less than what he was paying here full time to actually schedule and take all the emails and the chat and book all the jobs in and then follow up on the trades. Once they've finished the job and going to the next one, she could see them on the platform. Uh, she could remind them to close off on their iPad so they could be invoiced and she'd invoice the job. Now, it's very simple because it's a platform, online platform they were using. So their issue was time and money not the process. The process already existed. They just didn't have the confidence that, that someone else could do it because in small business you think that you can do it better than everyone else. And, look, I can tell you, you can't. There's a lot brighter people that are better at the admin than we are and they're a lot more efficient and a lot more cost efficient. So that's one. So scheduling any size business as it comes to scheduling trade, easy done. Um, uh, bookkeeping, larger businesses, we've got uh, VAs that will sit there and just do one part of the bookkeeping. It could be just invoicing. That's all they do all day, sending out invoices and the other the other team just takes in the, uh, the, the bills and logs them for payment. Wow. These things take them. So if you get offshore that, you're halfway there. Um, property management, again, property management, it's a platform. There's several platforms that we use in property it's all data entry. 
cumbersome hundreds of hours of data entry. Most of it is creditors receipting and, and trust accounting. It's actually not hard for a bookkeeper to do that. But again, it already exists. The process exists. Once you learn the process, for instance, there's a program called Property Tree. We've got four people trained in Property Tree. They get jobs coming in every two or three minutes on our project management software. They jump on Property Tree, they data enter and add folders and create files. That takes, takes hours to do that. I mean, a property manager would, a full time assistant for a property manager would save her 30 hours a week. So she really only has to work 10. All she has to do is take the phone calls and organize the, uh, the maintenance. That's really all she has to do. And then go see new clients and build the business because all the admin can be done offshore. There's th three examples for you, three different industries, uh, very easily done. Uh, and it's not new. Uh, I mean, Telstra's been doing it since the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, I believe. They, they took their, their, their um, call centres offshore and it's been getting better and better with the advent of technology, easier to do. Yep, yep. And I know other things, you, people, uh, I mean, social media posting, uh, 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 artwork, graphics, even uh, even writing documents and reports where you can just record something, send that off, it gets typed up, populated in. So what I see the extra value that you're offering there, by the way, is, you know, coming back to, to this ladder um, that we, we've talked about is people get so close to their business we it, like you know it's called you know store blindness in in retail where the the, the owner walks past um, walks past the uh, torn carpet each day and doesn't even see it mm. uh, the, or you know walks past the mark on the wall but doesn't see it because they get store blindness people in their own business that one and two person business they get blind to what goes on, the insanity, you know, the craziness that's going on. Uh, an outsider goes, what the heck? What are you doing? But they've just got into that to the habit. I just I was thinking as you were as you were talking there, I love this particular quote that I I found. It said, you know, here, the only thing standing between you and your goals is that bullshit <laughs> story that you keep telling yourself. And uh Part of your job and my job and anyone trying to actually help facilitate transformation and get people moving up the ladder is challenging the bullshit story that is running between people's ears. Uh, no one else can do it as well as me. Well, we call that BS. It, 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 besides it being a belief system, no one can do it as well as me. It's a bullshit belief because someone will do it as well, if not better. And even if they don't do it as well, but it, and they do it ninety five percent instead of a hundred. But as you say, some of your people will be doing it at one hundred and ten percent, not at the the hundred. Um, you can be freed up to go and sell or do the things you like doing, or be down the beach while someone else is doing it at the ninety five percent. But as in most cases, it's not going to be ninety five percent. But it's the bullshit belief that's holding the person back. What do you say about that? Like a hundred percent, and and really. To get past that, they need, well, basically they need a business coach. So we generally, if it's a large client we're looking at, unless they've been through uh, a process with a, um, a process engineer or a business coach to change two things, their mindset and their written procedures and business flow or process flow, mm -hmm. we generally won't even look at them. We've actually resigned clients recently and sent them out to process engineers and business coaches and suggested once they're at that level, we can then look at staffing them up because they're not they're not organised and they don't have the mindset to go forward. So unless you've seen them and you've trained them and they're ready, then it's too early for them to come to us because it will fail. And we know it will fail, so we don't take that business on. We we don't take on anything that's going to fail. And unless they've got the right mindset and have steps in place and have someone coaching them through it, if they don't have the skill set. We won't go near them. We just won't take that business on. Not worth it. I remember going to one of your um, seminars a while ago. Like, it's my favourite story. I, if I can tell it, if you let Please. me tell it, I will. Yeah. Um, I went to one of your seminars and we used to do three phone calls for each client, for instance. And your words were, you really have to do five phone calls for every single client before they will 
actually buy something from you. As in follow-up, so, touch point, the R factor, frequency yeah, times uh, quality of contact. Yeah, 100%. So, so I took that one thing, I like to take one thing away and implement rather than going home with a, a notebook full of notes. Mm -hmm. Implemented it, and I think the afternoon I made $10,000 just by ringing everyone a couple of extra times uh, that day. So, so process, have that process. So, so that's now in our procedures that when we follow people up, it's a five, it's a five phone call deal. Yep. It's not three phone calls and, oh, look, I don't think they want to hear from me. No, they're busy. They've got lives. I'm not their priority. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we're not their priority. Their families or their mates are their priority. So we'll need to make those extra calls to make sure that they, they tell us a yes or a no before we stop calling. Uh, we learned that from one of your seminars. So that then tells us if they're ready. So if they've been to someone like you, and they've got the right mindset, and we follow them up correctly, and they have process and procedure, that turns into revenue, then they can afford us, and then they can outsource. So it's a process. So you know what I mean? They, you've got to get it in the right sequence, and the first thing is learn how to sell. And uh, I don't know anyone who does that better than you, teaching people how to sell. Well, it's very kind of you to say that, mate. I mean, literally yesterday I was out on the road with, uh, uh, with a sales rep. I mean, it's, it's rare that I do it these days, but our, our coaches and affiliates do it. The Japanese have a, a, a thing they call the Gemba Walk. Gemba Walk. Go to where the work is. Don't sit in the boardroom going, this is what should happen or this is what's happening. Now, get out and actually see what is actually happening. And, by the way, Motorola also found that um, – in terms of improving sales, if you do classroom teaching with people, but then go out on the road and coach them and see what they're implementing, you get a 400% better result. Now, sales training works, but you get a 400% better result when you go out on the road. So I was out on the road yesterday, go, went to about six different sites with this uh, fellow who, by the way, was willing to take feedback. So I observed what he was doing and little things like, um, not letting the client finish the sentence before jumping in. Uh, clearly, that doesn't help. Um, you know, giving out information, but then not actually uh, summarising and getting what we call micro agreement. How does that sound to you? Is that the sort of thing you're looking for? Would that work for you? So the conversation was stilted. It, it didn't flow. And then another thing was where uh, he put a, a plan to the client and then just went, okay, um, so... And it's like there's no summary or attempted, not, I'm not saying close, but to take the sale to the next step. And I said, so what would you guys need to see or hear to feel comfortable about moving this forward? What would need to happen to get this up and running? And they went, well, we just need to get some paperwork. But he wasn't going to ask that question. He's gone, man, I learned so much on the road there. But he was, again, store blind. He wasn't aware of what he was doing. He was just into a habit, a routine, a pattern. Sometimes people call it a compulsion. And until someone saw him and then was, you know, in a, in a, in a calm, constructive way and gave feedback, he would have kept doing that. But we actually, I think, off the back of yesterday, two deals were done. Um, so one of our goals with this particular client is to get 15 clients on this particular um, buying program. Well, we, we they already had eight. There's another two that were done just yesterday based on the fact, not because of me, but as you said, the process and the procedure that we we gave them. Um, and so that's part of the part of the coaching process is is to help people see the insanity that they're doing, both in their thinking and their behaviors. Uh, but they need the right mindset. I just want to show you this is one of the models that we use when we work with people. And you you touched on this, is we say, you know. People want to get different results, but, of course, to get different results, they've got to do things differently. And often they say, well, just give me the strategy. Tell me tell me what I need to do. Um, uh, and we go, there's no use giving you the strategy if you don't have the right mindset, the right thinking, the right inner voice. What are you saying to yourself? Um, because if you've got a mindset, it's poor me, I can't do that, or, mate, uh, uh, I, 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 I'm not in the driver's seat. We go. You got to be. You got to say to yourself, "I'm in the driver's seat. I'm 100% responsible." Because if you go, then also nothing is difficult. Everything's possible. Well, that's a way better mindset than um, than just well. We'll get, I'll tell you, but we say it's like putting good seed into bad soil. 
you, you, give, you give people the information and it's the wrong mindset. So that's what you're talking about there, let alone the actual feedback and coaching to help them, help them move forward. What do you say to that? 100%. You've got to have the right mindset up front and before you get a strategy. And then once the strategy is in place, you, you need coaching to go to that next level. And you're quite right. It's the little things that people forget because it's not a process yet. And, and coaching will get the processes right. Once the processes are right, revenue grows. Once revenue grows, you can then pop yourself up to the org chart one more spot and then one more spot and then one more spot. 100% correct, mate. Mindset is, is so much more than just it's the culture, a good positive energy in, in your business. And you need to drive that because if you roll in there and tell everyone to be positive uh, and you're not, it's not going to work. Mm. 100% can tell you right now. So if you have someone in your organisation that is not positive, then I would suggest that you seriously look at uh, moving that person on somewhere else in the org chart or asking them to leave because it's like a cancer in your organisation. You need to be positive. You need positive people around you uh, because even if you don't make it and you're positive, you'll be happy about it at least. Yep. It's a good start. Yep, you yep. Might, and, but you will get higher than you would have done sitting in that negative space, that negative thought process. It's never going to work. Um, you need to have the energy and be the driver and then everyone else will follow and it will turn into revenue. All you have to do is put a smiley face on your door so when you come to work in the morning, even if you've had a bad day or a bad night and you're not happy, you look at the smiley face on the door and you put a smile on and you come in positive. If you don't, it will just resonate through your whole office. And through yep, your stuff. Yep, yep. Which, again, is why we are so uh, committed to the idea that everybody in the organisation uh, gets exposed to this area of personal development, understanding the power of mindset. So I'll just, again, I'll just share the screen because we, we've seen this time and time and time again, uh, and you've touched on it, the importance of everyone getting on the same page around attitude, mindset, that I'm in control of my mind, that, you know, the great Zig Ziglar talks about, you know, attitude determines altitude. Because if we just focus on, even if we just focus on sales or management or marketing strategy, you can do all of that. But if you do it, but people have the wrong mindset or a negative mindset or a disempowering mindset, or they don't understand what taking responsibility means, for example, or they don't understand what um, a negative story is, some of the, the language we bring into places around what does breakthrough mean? What does being authentic mean? What does feedback is feed forward mean? Uh, because in most cases, people come from different backgrounds, whether it be family background, schooling background. Did they have a swimming coach? Did they? How did they grow up? And then all of a sudden they roll up in your workplace just because they can type or answer the phone or even sell. But if we don't all get aligned on the same page around what positive attitude is, what positive self-talk is, uh, what goal setting is. And we're one of the one of the, we what we've done over the last two years is delved back into the best of the best. Um, uh, we've got studies that we've done on um, seven different global studies on over you know 10,000 different people and companies and gone, what are the best of the best doing? And if we pass that information on to people and then coach them in implementing it into their business, we know their business takes off. One of the tips you've already talked about there, one of the best of the best, smartest solutions is morning stand-up meetings. Like my client that we just did some work with yesterday, go, mate, when do you guys meet? Oh, we don't. Well, how can everyone get on the same page if you don't actually meet? So now they've run, they're doing morning, a little five to 10 minute stand-up meeting what are we working on? What's going well? Who did something well yesterday? So we've got a little agenda that we work through and the guys have gone, mate, that is making such a huge difference to the attitude and the focus yeah. of people uh, by doing those stand-up meetings. And another thing I've talked to this particular client about, which the guy on the road told me about yesterday, I said, mate, what you're going to do is catch people doing things right. And at the end of the day, just say, thanks for your day. When, when was the last time you actually thanked someone for their day? And he's like, oh, I've never done it. Well, this guy said to me yesterday, mate, people are in shock when he first did it, that he literally went down and said, mate, I just want to say thanks for that. Thanks for getting that delivery out on time. Thanks for helping that customer out. Or just thanks for the way you've done things today. He said, just that one micro action, talk about a little step on the ladder. I mean, how hard is it? 
for someone running a business to go, thanks for your day. And look, I totally agree. And people don't realise how much influence they have on their on their staff and their business partners. They don't realise what you know, uh, appreciating someone's actions and and how that impacts them. It's it's actually quite powerful. Uh, a wise old CFO of mine years back, so don't ever underestimate the amount of, uh, of um, influence you have on your team. Oh. And, be, and be careful how you use that. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's what we say. Um, people join businesses and they leave bosses. People yes. join the company and they leave the boss. Uh, uh, and the number one reason they leave, and this is research, this is not just me making up this is proven research they join company they leave bosses and the number one reason they leave is because they don't feel valued 100 percent correct you you need to feel valued i have in fact i don't even call my employees employees they're all my business partners and and the fact that i call them my business partners all the time they have ownership on the thing coleman maggie artists is a brand that we have um, and and uh, Celeste is amazing at what she does. And we set some pretty big goals when we started, but it hasn't gone to plan yet. It will. It's just not happened in the way we thought it would happen because there's been some instances there that have changed the direction of all our lives and we had to adjust. But, you know, four and a half years later, I think it's four and a half years now, we're still there chipping away at it and just waiting to get over a few little humps that are obstacles and then that, you know, that five-year plan now will turn into a 10-year plan. Either way, it'll happen. It's always been my goal that it would be a lot longer time to get to where we needed to go. Um, being younger, her goal was shorter. Uh, being wiser, I extended it, uh, knowing that things happen in life. Mm. But um, our environment is happy. Everyone is happy. The people that we hot desk with in here, people drop in and out, not because they need a desk to work in, it's they get that human interaction, they get encouraged, we grab a cup of coffee downstairs, we have lunch together, it's a positive environment. If you are unhappy and you're coming to work, I'm the first person to send you home and come back with a happy attitude or don't, don't come back. Well, that's one of the things we talk about at Every Empowerment Institute is, in fact, the ecosystem. Just like a plant in a garden, you know, the soil, the water, the fertiliser, uh, the human beings are the same. And as you said, things happen in life. And the fact is, we say, that's what we call it, whole of person, whole of business, because you can't just say, I just want to deal with the work person. The yeah. work person actually has kids, relationships, money, balance sheet, house, marriage, divorce, health, all of these things. And what we know is when you engage the whole person uh, in the business and you you as a, as a business owner show interest in that person, um, whether it be Southwest Airlines, the, the most successful airline uh, in the world in terms of profit, consistency, or a small business uh, going, mate, he asked about my kid, he asked about my dog, he asked about my horse. Um, we know that you get far more engagement. You don't do it just for selfish reasons, but we know you deal with the whole person, you get a far better result. I just want to show you, Paul, this particular uh, set of studies that we've pulled together uh, over the last couple of years, we should call it the best, the best of the best. And what we've done is taken seven major international research projects, two, two and a half, almost two and a half thousand small, medium and large businesses going, what are they doing to grow and be successful? Um, what are uh, senior executives doing with companies that have more than 500 companies with 500 employees? What are they doing? The large companies doing. And then we delved down into a lot of research on selling, which you, you touched on before. What, what are the best performers doing? What are, what are successful performers doing in selling? And particularly those that deal selling to C-suite decision makers, CFOs, CEOs, because um, that's slightly different um, because, again, most people don't learn these things at school. Then we looked at uh, a fantastic study that Google did on 10,000 of their managers to go, what makes a great manager and how do you actually train a manager to be a great manager? There's 10 traits that they uh, discovered and we've now our systems and our, our programs um, check a company and go, are you doing these things? And, and if you are, great, you get one star. And as you move further down the track, and implement more and more of them, you go for what we call five gold star certification. 
uh, so that so that it's it's not just we're giving you the information. We actually want you. We say because it's not about information. We say you know you can go to YouTube and get information. It's the implementation of that imp- information that makes that moves the dial. That makes the difference. We then looked at some studies: four hundred and fifty thousand employees across four hundred and twenty six companies on what they were doing. Uh, and this one here, particularly this one, um, fourteen hundred large. 15, uh, five, Fortune 500 companies, um, what the top 11 were doing to outperform the market by almost 700%. We've put all of those, all of that knowledge into our certification program to first of all go into any business, small, medium, or large, and go, right, how do you compare with the best in the world? And then what do you need to do to grow to be one of the best? And knowing that as you move from one star, two star to five stars, you get ticks, you get stars, you get certified. And as you take those steps up the ladder, you're certainly making more money and you're certainly having a freer, more leveraged, more scaled life. So we're not just making stuff up. It's based on these seven major international studies on day by day, step by step actions in business to move up that ladder of business evolution and empower the people so that just as you say, you want a happy workplace because happy workplaces are productive workplaces. So, Paul, is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to share before we wrap up? Because I'm conscious of your your time as well. What haven't we spoke about that you'd like to you'd like someone interested in business empowerment to know about? Actually, I think you've covered everything, mate. But I'd just like to just quickly add: we have a a, a measurement in our business, and it's it's a very simple measurement, and. It, you know, we used to measure everything on a balanced scorecard. We could tell you ah, nice. about sales. But I developed another one. It's just a zero to 10. When I ring my staff, I ask them, hey, you know what? On a scale of one to 10, how happy are you today? They give me about a seven. Oh, well, I know a seven's not good enough because my benchmark's eight and a half. What do I need to do to bring you up to eight and a half today? What do we need to do to make you happier today? Mm. Pretty much that comment does the trick anyways because I know someone cares. Mm. Um, so the happiness scale that we use, we use that not because it's a, a measure of their happiness, it's a measure of my happiness. Because if I can come in every day, as I've been doing since I was 20 years old, and be in a happy, positive environment, it's better for my health, it's better for the business, it's better for them, it's better for everybody. So if someone is not an eight and a half consistently, then they're not in the right business or business group. They need to be finding a job somewhere else because this is my retirement. I go to the beach a couple of times a week with my mates. Then I come to work in a happy environment with people that want to be here and that are achieving their goals and successes and whatever their level of success is. So that happiness score is probably the most important part of our business. When I ring the Philippines, the first question I ask my operations manager, they are 17,000 cases yesterday of COVID. And my question was on a scale of one to 10, where is your happiness um, gauge today? And most of them are still sitting on an eight only because we've got people in place to ring them and just ask them how they are uh, and we care. And if there's struggles, we try and fix those struggles for them best we can. We can't fix some of the things that are an issue, but we can get their happiness score from, you know, from eight, eight and a half for that day. It's a good day across the board. And it just makes it a pleasure to come to work. If you go to work and you're miserable every single day, and you're surrounded by by just grief and unhappiness, you're wasting your life, man. You've just got to create the environment that you want to retire into before you retire, and then you can be coming into work till you're 90. It won't matter. Mate, brilliant. Brilliant. The happiness scale. Happiness scale. I love it. Now, I've been taking a pile of notes here. I'm just going to summarise for the listener because summarising is good. Uh, I'm going to just go, one, writing procedures. Two, buy back your time. Three, get your life back. Four, uh, um, proceduralization is the key to scanning. You know, if you're working for time, you're always going to be working. If you start set up systems, you start to get passive income. You get your life back. Um, delegation. You, you talked about VAs, everything from bookkeeping you know, to, to, to some of the other tasks in terms of specific procedurization. Uh, and of course, as you say, the right mindset, procedurization linked with 
Um, the org chart, you talked about that org chart as well. I like the fact that you also talked about you're good with numbers, which is a critical thing part, which is one of our programs that we have on money and financial literacy. So important. And then that whole point one, are you as the leader of the business taking responsibility to manage your mindset in terms of your own happiness and positivity, but two, the happiness scale. And, and as you say, just in asking someone, uh, how are you, where are you on the scale, means you're showing your care. And as we said, people join companies and leave bosses. So when you say show that you care, not only do they care more about your business, they care more about the results that they, they have. Now, by the way, talking of results, Paul, um, how do people get in contact with you? Uh, what website or what email or what phone numbers? What's the best way to get in contact oh, with gee, if you? If you Google Paul Baggy Artist, I'll be everywhere. But if you email me at paul at eastwestvaservices.com, I'll get that directly. Uh, you can call me. I'm old school. I'm 55. So if you've got a phone that actually still rings people, it's 0414 So feel free to give me a call. But I'll, within a few hours, you'll get a call back and, uh, and have a chat. And look, it's not for everybody, but it's worth having the discussion so that you are aware of what you need to do to get there. To that Fantastic. Point. But, hey, Paul, I think people should really listen to this and watch this again and make notes because there's a whole range of action points in this podcast. This really has been a time uh, to help empower people, give people the power, the knowledge, the systems, the ideas to help move up that ladder of business evolution. Paul, thanks so much for your time today, mate, and uh, I look forward to seeing you very soon. No, mate, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye. 